Okay, well, um, here we are at the uh, Harassus Extraordinary Meeting USA. Uh, my name is Bill Douglas, Gotham Private Capital. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm joined uh, by... alphabetical order. So uh, in, that, in that case, Guy, we could start with you. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. And it's a pleasure to speak with um, everyone here, on, especially on this topic, which is super awesome. Um, so I am the managing director at Pacific Pine, which is an early stage start startup consulting agency um, where we help folks get from zero basically to one um, through a bunch of um, different types of programs. Um, previous to that, I was in a couple rapid growth startups and dabbled in the venture capital industry. Um, and actually today, my team just launched the pre-beta um, of something called Founder House, which is the company that I'm working on, which creates access and equity um, for founders globally. So we're excited about that as well. Oh, very impressive. Thank you, Sky. Um, Angela? Oh, okay. So, hi, thank you for having me here, and I am a scientist by training, and uh, some years ago, um, around late 2013, um, I founded a company called Temple Bioscience, and we work with specialized human stem cells, um, for short. They're called IPICs, and they are stem cells with pluripotency, so they can be derived into many, many derivative cell types in the human body. And these stem cells are originally reprogrammed from blood cells or skin cells. Mm -hmm. So these derivative cell types are very useful for disease modeling. So as a life science tools provider, um, as part of our business model, we offer these derivative cell types to drug development scientists in the pharma industry. And they use these cells to screen drug candidates to develop um, the next step in their R&D process. And um, the second part of our business is to work on novel stem cell therapies ourselves for diseases with um, unmet medical needs. Um, some of them are orphan diseases. So uh, we aim uh, to provide off-the-shelf allogeneic stem cell therapies in the future. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, allogeneic, uh, I think, is clearly the way to go. And, you know, whenever I think of IPSC, IPSCs, uh, it, it makes me think of uh, the eminent uh, Nobel laureate, Shinya Yamanaka, who, of course, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for deriving uh, embryo uh, induced pluripotent stem cells for the first time. And yeah. on that note, um, we can kind of uh, virtually jump across the Pacific Ocean here from San Francisco and on over to Japan, uh, where we have Mr. Yoshiki Sasaki joining us as well. Mr. Sasaki, perhaps you can tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Among the investees, like a company like Alibaba in the early stage, and the I was once a board of board member of that company, and then uh, I became invest uh, independent uh, in several years ago, and now I'm managing a corporate group of called Social Impact Solutions, and we have two main businesses. One is a platform for uh, visiting home uh, medical service. For age, for aged people, and we mm -hmm. want to scale that globally. And the other one is a platform to accelerate startups. We have several companies who one is uh, doing incubator management all over Japan, and the other one is startup investment and uh, start investment banking for startup companies. So we are helping in every phase of the startups, but mainly this is in Japan. So we are trying to create a cross-border platform, uh, cooperating with other partners in the other parts of the world. That's where we are. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Sasaki. And thank you to our other esteemed panelists here. Um, you know, we might as well 
kind of get started in some discussion. Uh, I'll just read the uh, uh, the topic quickly, just to kind of review startups in times of pandemic. The COVID pandemic has been reducing the creation of startups, challenging their survival and limiting their growth. How can startups grasp new business opportunities that may arise during and after the crisis? How can they manage to secure funding and mentoring? And you know, um, before we kind of tackle those those questions, I thought maybe we could t- could talk about you know how the pandemic has uh, reduced the creation of startups, or you know the effect that the pandemic has had on the uh, the startup ecosystem uh, um, in in general. If anyone would would like to uh, comment or make any observations there. Mm-hmm. And if not, um, you know, we can we can move along to the questions uh, in the in the in the topic. Um, yeah. In terms of how startups can kind of uh, uh, deal with the challenges that have that have you know arisen uh, during the during the pandemic, and maybe also we can look at uh, uh, opportunities that that might be ahead as we as a uh, um, as a society start to uh, turn the corner and and uh, and move on, even uh, with a bit of light at the at the end of the tunnel at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, I could definitely chime in on some of what I'm seeing and um, sure. kind of the landscape shift. I would say um, I would think that I would I personally think that I've been seeing a lot of tremendous growth in the startup um, ecosystem, especially with things like the creator economy um, and the gig economy, and um, really ensuring that um, we are funding and providing access to artists and creators is definitely a huge shift I've been seeing. And I think that's from the amount of time that folks have had, you know, on their computers and having that time to have that creative freedom where a lot of things have shifted and you're seeing things such as like, um, you know, Bitcoin and NFTs and all of the crazy um, new ideas surfacing. I've also been seeing kind of this shift with how we look at uh, early stage funding. Um, I've been seeing things that we might have called a pre-seed or a, even a seed round. It's now, or what we used to see as a seed round is now almost a pre-seed round. And we're seeing a lot of really um, social, new social fabric of companies such as Clubhouse, for instance, um, and even things such as like um, the way we date online <laughs> um, has definitely, I've seen a huge shift in boom. Uh, you know, a couple of things that come to mind are like Monet dating, um, where you kind of just send somebody a photo versus a something like um, S'mores date, where you are more anti-superficial date dating app. So it's really interesting to see these emerging companies taking a more creative route, at least in the realm that I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Sky. And, and, and Angela, in your field, uh, biotechnology, you know, would you have any, uh, anything to share there? Well, I think because of the pandemic is a medical problem at the very beginning and at its core, uh, the biotech industry, as I know, has been super busy. Part, partly to get research going during the early phase of COVID-19 to figure out what is going on, all the way to developing diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutics. I mean, the industry has been so busy. Um, and funding has been amazing for the industry so far. And I think investors continue to realize the importance of medicine. Um, so we as scientists are very much comforted this time because we realize that investors do care about our industry and we are valued. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think um, this has been good for us because we feel um, there's a boost in funding and some of my colleagues in the industry have been able to raise um, amazingly large series D, C, or C, D, and E rounds. So I think these are encouraging news for everyone in the industry. And also as someone who works in regenerative medicine, um, we have seen investors um, come into our space of gene, cell and gene therapy mostly as part of regenerative medicine. Mm-hmm. And they have been um, actively investing. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to more engagements with investors in our space in the future. Yeah. 
Excellent. And uh, Mr. Mr. Sasaki, you're uh, in the healthcare yeah. field, um, yes. among others, uh, sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, after COVID, uh, we we have, uh, have I mean, as a investor to early stage company, uh, we are seeing the change of how we look at the deal. And the formerly we interviewed, and we live near the startups, and then now we cannot see I any mean, physically. Therefore. Uh, Especially when we talk about the foreign deals, uh, we have to create a net that we will have uh, very trusted partners in the local site and mm -hmm. then uh, communicate uh, remotely and mm -hmm. take it as a regular routine to look after all the deals. So this kind of a change of mode of finding deals and following up the deal uh, is uh, already coming, and we are seeing uh, somewhat more, uh, I mean, increased efficiency of doing that. Therefore, mm -hmm. some of the change, uh, it, I mean, uh, not returning to the former level, and that is good. And the, for example, the, the level of physical uh, moving is uh, on the average one third of the former days. And that, I mean, reduce the energy, for example, and also <laughs> increase the effective time. So, uh, therefore, of course, uh, it, there was a challenge to change the mode, how we deal with the these events. But uh, I think overall, this is good for people, that people change the paradigm to a digitized age. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, that's um, you know that's a that's a great point, and I wonder if people feel like uh, um, some of these changes that have been wrought by the by the pandemic, uh, as we can see it right here. You know, we're all, we're all meeting digitally instead of uh, a, a, instead of in person. Um, is that going to sort of uh, increase the, the 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 pace and the uh, and and just sort of accelerate the process of uh, of, of doing deals and, and startups uh, securing their their funding and do you know due diligence and meetings and all the rest. I think uh, we need when you especially talk about the startups, uh, we cannot judge from the Excel sheet how they have performed. Mm -hmm. Then we have to focus how they are going to perform. Therefore, uh, we need to create a, a sort of a panel in local sites so that people can look after these, uh, if, uh, I mean, in the change of the environment of the company in near their site. So, uh, therefore, our, uh, the, from the organizational point of view, we have to be a sort of distributed resource uh, organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, Disky, I saw you nodding. You know, um, what what do you think about the pace of of deal flow in this new uh, paradigm? Yeah, I've definitely seen a huge increase, and personally, some investors I know they haven't been um, at all upset about it. Um, mm -hmm. I think definitely um, to the point that we do need a way that we can um, sift through the, all of the deals coming in and kind of almost like. How, how we value the deals differently and especially the deals coming all over the place. I've been seeing a lot of folks um, really grow like their network is, and making sure that, you know, deals get into the right hands of folks that can, can fund these companies um, and even just even more emerging managers and fund managers and syndicates and all of these kind of ways that um, either folks can get into venture capital because they know that there is so um, much deal flow at the moment or um, how we can really kind of diversify and um, spread deals along for our colleagues um, because a lot of innovation is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Angela, you said that uh, um, COVID has been kind of a renaissance in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, biotech, the biotech investment scene, huh? Yeah, I, I I've seen a lot of colleagues um, raising a figures, you know, follow on funding rounds with no problems. Some, um, as recently announced, have been able to raise four hundred million dollars for their Series E or some follow on or Series C or 
these are more like later stage startups um mm -hmm. raising like 239 or to 400 range which i thought the numbers are pretty huge um mm -hmm. so so and they are very respected investors um for every round so so it's encouraging that um they these, these innovative startups and biotech they can stay um, private and then continue to develop their pipeline of therapeutic candidates mm -hmm. and expand their pipeline. So that, as you know, um, requires quite a bit of R and D cash um, due to clinical trials and other things. So it's it's encouraging. Um, I am not as aware of smaller size deals. Um, so I'm wondering about how seed rounds or A rounds are doing during the pandemic. But most of my colleagues that I know um, know quite well, they're doing follow-ons and then the follow-ons are pretty large. Yeah, they're doing well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, maybe not specifically in biotech, but in terms of seed rounds or aid rounds, A rounds in other uh, industries, maybe Sky or Mr. Sasaki would, would care to comment. Yes. Uh... The generally speaking, the that uh, seed round or pre A or A round is becoming I th I think difficult uh, because uh, you need to have a deeper understanding of the capability of the management and how they are doing, and with a remote uh, contact, there is naturally have a limitation. So uh, that's why uh, for us uh, we. Uh, we use people at the local site where we, whom we can trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, maybe in this sort of virtual world we're all, we've all been living in, it's a bit harder to establish that trust, um, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's you know maybe a bit of the a bit of the downside. You know, um, I wonder if we might talk about. Uh, you know, what challenges uh, startups are going to face, maybe some new challenges that have come up in this era and that might be difficult, uh, you know, continue to be uh, uh, impediments that we that need to be overcome moving forward. I guess my question, I don't have an answer. I have a question. Mm -hmm. The question sure. I have is about valuation. Mm -hmm. um, so my question would be, so if, if the follow-up fundraising rounds become pretty large and continue to stay pretty large. What are investors expecting uh, for their exits? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, um, you know, they're clearly expecting something uh, pr proportional. <laughs> so <laughs> right. we start to become a bit uh, <laughs> mind blowing and perhaps uh, uh, not realistic. Is that right? <laughs> I mean, that would make sense, right? Investors put in money, they need X. I'm an entrepreneur, so I think, you know, mm -hmm. when investors invest, they need, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 X exits. Yeah. Um, the question I have is, what, what are they thinking currently if they invest in large rounds or they continue to uh, invest in large rounds as follow-ons? Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the valuation expectations for the startups when they exit? Mm-hmm. And timeline, of course, that's tied into it. I, I'm just asking questions. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a that's a worthwhile topic for sure. And you know, um, Angela you talked about in biotech that uh, there's almost been kind of a, a psychological shift. You know, a lot of enthusiasm for the biotech sector because uh, everyone's wanted to, you know, have a have a have a vaccine, um, you know, for this virus, and it's sort of. Um, Inspired, you know, new newfound confidence in uh, mm -hmm. these, these, you know, scientists at these companies that are that are doing the hard work in the labs. Yeah. And I wonder if anyone would like to talk about any other industries that have uh, have seen a resurgence or uh, are seeing newfound strength um, and enthusiasm from investors and others as a result of the uh, the pandemic conditions. Yeah, for example, I'm doing a healthcare service for mm -hmm. uh, the in the time of pandemic, people do not want to go to hospital. Therefore, we do uh, the home visit of a limited number of people and the sort of telemedicine type of thing. Mm -hmm. And that is at the moment, uh, from my eye, is a sort of bubble. 
in the variations of people. No. There is a too much expectation of that. And uh, we know that that cannot be a uh, right exit for these deals uh, because mm -hmm. we know the healthcare industry, which is not like a internet platformer. You need mm -hmm. to finally have a people to people contact and care, which is not that uh, I mean exponential growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, in terms of healthcare services, you know, I mean, I, I think about in the uh, in the, the the darkest days of the pandemic. I was working from home, of course, but my wife, who's a, a physician, was working at home as well. Um, you know, I would be here in my office, and she was next door in the bedroom uh, with her camera set up, seeing patients. And uh, you know, uh, it really depends on on the practitioner. Um, for her, she's an endocrinologist. She needs to be a bit more hands-on with patients. So she found uh, telemedicine to be a bit limiting. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we've just read in the Wall Street Journal today that uh, Amazon is launching uh, uh, some sort of B2B uh, telemedicine initiative. So it seems like, you know, telemedicine may be uh, one area that's also going to, um, you know, have, have noticeable strength uh, as a result of these pandemic conditions going forward, don't, don't you think? Definitely would agree. Mm -hmm. So um, another question on the uh, agenda is, you know, how how can startups sort of in this new era manage to secure funding and mentoring? And, you know, we've talked a little bit about, um, well, at least in, in biotech, the, the funding is is quite strong. Um, what about, you know, other funding in other industries or this other question of mentoring? Uh, you know, it's really quite, I think, a lot harder to have the human connection uh, with a mentor uh, under these conditions. So feel free to comment on that as well. Um, well, from an early stage standpoint, um, with a bunch of, I really work with folks in that really zero to one-ish stage after Series A, um, kind of no more need my services. So um, I'm definitely seeing that the way that these folks are, you know, being able to connect is there's a really big shift in kind of the way we access folks. You'll see things like the Gen Z VC Slack channels or a bunch of these um, Slack channels or Discord groups or um, small communities that have like grown by 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 people in the matter mm -hmm. of a few days. Um, and then also with the rise of Clubhouse, we're seeing a lot of small um, groups where people are giving advice or pitch practice. Um, so I think that that sense of community as well is helping folks kind of gain um, network like they might have not even prior to the pandemic. I think that we're seeing a huge shift with how we can connect to folks. And, you know, before that, we would really just do maybe LinkedIn and, you know, hope for a tweet on Twitter or something like that. Um, but mm -hmm. now with these, again, like these more socially fabriced tools, um, we're seeing a lot of innovation on how um, startup founders and startup experts and advisors and VCs all really want to connect with each other and kind of learn and stay in the now about these new trends and emerging um, kind of topics and whatnot. Um, so I've definitely <laughs> been seeing, and I don't know if it'll ever actually really kind of go back to the way it was before. I'm mm -hmm. seeing like so many more accelerators, so many more digital programs that I've ever seen in my life. Um, way more of like huge funds doing um, like free courses and, and things like that as well. And, and maybe three more um, accelerators or something um, within this year, which has been really crazy for me to see. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, if I may, um, yes. for mentorship, I, I've been reaching out to various communities that I belong to within the biotech industry. And I sense that everyone who is a veteran is quite patient with the fact that we're all virtually connected. And so they tried their best to um, deal with the issue, quote unquote, you know, that, that we can't be in person. But I mm -hmm. think a lot of times um, we've learned to communicate differently just because we cannot be in the same room at the same time. So there's like a style of engagement change. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, because we're in the virtual world. So I feel like we are much more direct um, with questions and discussions. So there's, because you, you can't really be in the same room and see how people react. And there's no, you know, like a lot of, um, I guess, physical or not physical, but like EQ kind of behavioral patterns mm -hmm. you just don't see over the phone or Zoom or something. So mm -hmm. I feel like people communicate differently mm -hmm. um, with mentors. Um, and it's okay because we are all hopeful that the vaccine will be out and then the pandemic will be behind us and we go back to a new world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, it seems like a challenge for a lot of startups uh, is getting through, has always been kind of getting through the gatekeepers and getting getting through to the right investor. Um, do you think that's become a bit easier? Are, are investors, venture, whether they're venture funds or others, are they have they been a little bit more open to, you know, accepting that LinkedIn connection or, uh, you know, uh, taking a look at that inbound email from an unknown party, maybe than they were uh, pre-pandemic? Or in a, maybe to put the question another way, um, have we ha, have has this um, have these conditions kind of helped build more bridges and you know and uh, and opened up you know more ready access to uh, uh, and and lines of communication between you know invest uh, startups and investors. Mm -hmm. um, from my experience and what I've seen, I would say yes. Um, mm -hmm. I see. Um, I think, too, I think a lot of folks are getting, again, we keep using the word innovation, but innovative on the way that they reach out. Um, I think I've seen like like one minute video pitches or something like that. Or um, I think one pagers are getting really big versus like sending your deck. So different ways that folks are trying to get in front of investors. Um, I've been seeing a shift of and I've also been seeing a lot of investors um, like I've never seen before also be providing so many research resources and access themselves um, to the community. Mm. Nice. I th yeah. Okay, then and the because of uh, this uh, change of pattern of communication, we are uh, building uh, the people who can be the hub of this kind of communication. Therefore, for us, we are, uh, com I mean, bu building the uh, partnerships with uh, accelerators uh, in the distant places and the venture capitals, and they have several deals they are looking after. And mm -hmm. then uh, at least we have uh, multiple people look, uh, talking about one thing. And then mm -hmm. you can have a total view of a different way of looking at that uh, phenomena, so to speak. Therefore, that increase the I mean the possibility that we are looking at the right uh, I mean, uh, phenomena, so to speak, happening at the startup. Then we can judge whether we can go ahead or we have to refrain from that. Mm -hmm. So uh, therefore. Uh, Having these partners uh, in different ways it helps us very much. Not just uh, us only doing, looking, uh, talking to the startups. Okay, great. Um, okay, let's see. We've got about uh, we've got about 15, 15 more minutes here. Um, is there any other kind of ground that uh, on this topic that you think? Uh, that we should cover that uh, that we haven't so far. But um, what about you know what about uh, um, any other future trends that we can that we can talk about that you know we may see coming out of this pandemic? You know, uh, Sky mentioned kind of the rise of of Clubhouse. Uh, clearly, it would not have you know had this. Uh, um, What's the what's the right analogy? It's just you know it, it's lightning bolt of, uh, of of phenomenal success, almost without almost without precedent. Um, I wonder if there are other um, other areas of, of of growth coming out of coming out of the pandemic that uh, you know that your any of our panelists are particularly optimistic about. If I may, for the biotech industry, it's mm -hmm. more about um, I think a lot of manufacturing concerns. Um, have become quite significant um, issues during 
the COVID, mm-hmm. both manufacturing of medicines, vaccines, and anything, and even random laboratory supplies. So the whole manufacturing supply chain, I believe, will start to shift because. COVID has kind of exposed weaknesses where mm-hmm. where there are, um, and the efficiency of manufacturing uh, must uh, improve over time. So that's something that um, I think everyone has noticed in the past year. That is something that must figure out how to do better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. When, uh, when you look at the startup scene uh, globally. Uh, I am seeing that uh, in the developing world, sometimes it is easier to accelerate the startups than established economies. Because mm. established, in the established economies, you have a lot of regulatory regulations and existing competitors. Therefore, uh, for example, especially for the healthcare sector, we have a very local uh, medical or care regulation, regulations, and mm-hmm. uh, which in most cases doesn't exist in a, uh, I mean, developing world. Then you mm-hmm. have a chance to create a better business model than mm-hmm. advanced world, for example. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we are starting to be active in Southeast Asia, India, and Africa, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, I, I, I really like those types of, uh, of examples. Um, you know, what would be something that could uh, take off faster in, uh, in India, for example, than in Japan or the U.S., Mr. Sasaki? What, what type of, uh, of healthcare business could accelerate yeah. quickly, do you yeah. think, in example, India or wherever? Uh, yeah, uh, there is uh, still uh, much has to be done for the healthcare sector. And mm-hmm. for example, uh, in Japan, we have a segregated uh, industry of doctors and nurses and caregivers to one receiver of the service. And from the uh, user, this is not the op- optimal situation. Mm-hmm. You have to have a holistic care for, for the user. And that is not possible because we already have a different industries, and uh, the communication between the industry is not there because they have uh, di- they are different companies. Therefore, they mm-hmm. do not share the data, for example, of the patient. Mm-hmm. Therefore, uh, you can create a brand new system of creating a system best for the user in the area where there is no existent players. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what we are now trying to create right now. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, well, uh, Angela, in the in the biotech industry, we know a thing or two about uh, about regulation, don't we? Oh yes. <laughs> Where should we start? <laughs> but um, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but in no, a way, no, I. I believe the FDA is trying to do what is best for patients at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. They're trying to make sure things are safe and mm-hmm. efficacious. So mm-hmm. um, I believe many uh, equivalent agencies from other countries, they kind of look to the US FDA as the gold standard for the world. Yeah. So if something is approved in the US, then EMA is more likely to... Um, give a favorable review, for yeah. example. And I believe Japanese equivalent agency is very similar. They, they, they wait for FDA to make a decision here in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've met many FDA scientists and reviewers in the past. Um, I believe they're all trying to do what is best for patients. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I think you're right that the the FDA kind of sets the standard, and uh, then that makes the process a bit easier for uh, some of these other regulatory agencies. Okay. Um, well, when do you think uh, 
life can get back to, to quote unquote normal for, uh, you know, for, for startups. You know, I think we're really dealing with really varied circumstances, right? I mean, Paris, I, I read, uh, is just going into about a, a lockdown for a period of one month. Uh, so we're really, you know, in some places anyway, uh, we're not out of the woods yet, so to speak. Um, you know, when do you, when do you feel like your respective industries will, will start to, uh, um, go back to, uh, you know, start to have a, a, a bit of more feeling of normalcy? Hopefully summer 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I've heard many rumors of, um, companies that where currently there's rotation and scheduling as to who is on site, who works from home. Um, mm-hmm. th- there's hope that everyone would be vaccinated by the summer. So then mm-hmm. more people can go on site and without lots of restrictions and things like that. So mm-hmm. I think we're hopeful in the biotech industry that summer will be the beginning of the post pandemic, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, for any of you that were traveling for work a lot before the pandemic, I'd be curious to know if you see yourself getting back to a normal travel schedule like that again, or if you'll, uh, if, if it'll be a whole new ball game now and you'll never return to uh, traveling as much as before. Yeah, uh, I think uh, for me, uh, the, I will travel, but the frequency probably will become half or one third of the previous days. Oh, that's, because that's we a very dramatic change. Ways. Yeah, these are ways of doing that. Uh, formerly, I traveled to, uh, almost two times a month to overseas, and the, but that's, that will decrease. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's a big drop. But that was a lot yeah, that's anyway, a so. lot of difference. For us and the in the conference world, I believe most people like myself, we feel that it's um it's very different to attend a virtual conference. So mm-hmm. for conferences that we normally go to every year, we will uh, hopefully continue to go and attend in person because mm-hmm. there are lots of hallway conversations and like ad hoc meetings that you have just because you're meeting people at the conference in person. Mm-hmm. It's very different. So. Yeah, I look forward to going back to conferences um, in person. And, and Sky, what about in your industry? Um, more in-person um, meetings, more, 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 more travel. Yeah, I would definitely say that very much less travel. <laughs> I would also agree with both points. Probably a third cut, and then also, you know, conferences and large networking events would be attending. Um, and I think that almost everything, I'm not sure if things will always just be in person. I think things will still might be online and I think we're going to see a huge shift in like access. Um, so things will probably still be digital. Um, however that might look like, but we'll also be able to kind of like, um, also be traveling again, which I am also excited about. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Well, um, yeah, we've got uh, five minutes or so left. Is there, uh, you know, we, we certainly welcome questions from anyone who's uh, joined us here. Uh, press the button to raise your hand. Um, otherwise, is there anything uh, any of my esteemed panelists feel that we, we haven't covered tonight? Well, I did see um, a question from the audience. Um, oh, good. From Sorry, our- I missed that. Oh, no worries. Um, And I would love to kind of address a little bit of this um, about how startups and how they get funded by women and the dramatically um, unfortunate statistics around that. And also just about being a parent um, and and having a company. I can attest to both of these things. Um, Would would you mind? I don't see the question. Would you mind reading it out loud for us? Sure. Um, um, She says... um, how have you seen startups ah. founded by women more affected during the pandemic or parents? How do we make this easier for them? Great. Thank you. Now I see it there. Yeah, of course. Um, I would definitely say it's been an extreme challenge for parents. And I think that we're also seeing founder or founders become a little bit more pickier um, with the investors that they choose and having more 
um, of that standing ground for themselves and figuring out really what it looks like to be a, be a founder and be a mother and, you know, be a person, um, Mm -hmm. kind of just the, the difference of how your whole life you can, you can, you can really kind of balance, um, as best you can. Right. So personally, I have a one-year-old baby. Um, so I had to make lots of sacrifices. Um, that's the reason I ended up going into consulting. Um, and then, yeah. And then kind of ending, starting this startup, um, as well was just a passion of mine, but it took a lot of, you know, those sacrifices and, and even too, with things such as raising venture capital, um, I think that there's a lot of funds doing great work and I'm also very hopeful about the new emerging fund managers, angel investors, as well as the syndicates. And I'm seeing more um, females and people of color um, really getting into the venture capital game, which I appreciate and is definitely necessary um, for the change that we need to see when it comes to diversity and equity in the ecosystem. Great. Yeah, well, as the father of two young daughters, I, I would love to see uh, see one of them, uh, um, you know, nurture a, a, an entrepreneurial uh, bug later in life and, <laughs> um, and contribute in that way. Well, uh, listen, I got a um, uh, an automatic warning from the Run the World system that our session is uh, is soon coming to an end. So I want to thank, uh, thank you, each of you, um, Sky, Angela, Mr. Sasaki, for uh, for joining us here, it's been a uh, a very very enjoyable, informative uh, discussion. So, just really appreciate each of your uh, contributions. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a Bye-bye. pleasure. Okay, here's all mine. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye.